Amen. Good morning. morning. Buenos dias. Ah, wow, impressive, impressive. Well, uh, it's a joy to be here this morning with you all. Um, If I have not had the privilege to meet you yet, my name is Nick Deckard, um, and I am here with my my family. Uh, My wife is Jacqueline Deckard, and we have four boys. Uh, We have Hudson, who many of you may remember. Uh, He's six and a half now. I can't leave out the half. We have... Titus, who's four and a half, Uh, Elijah or Elias, who's two and a half, and then just in in May, we we welcomed our fourth, uh, Lucas Arturo. Um, He's our our only Mexican citizen um, of the clan, but we are super blessed by by him as well. It's a real joy here this morning. It really is humbling um, just to be able to to stand here before you all and and deliver God's God's word. Uh, We are going to be in John 7. John 7 this morning. Before we read the text, I was asked to just give a very brief update uh, on the the ministry and work in in Mexico. And so uh, I just want to begin by just saying uh, a hearty thank you. Thank you to you all who have labored with us in prayer, um, who've supported us through texts and calls and cards and some of you puzzles. Um, just just uh, so, so blessed by each one of you and uh, by this congregation. I want to say first that we are grateful to Southside for what you guys do internally here within these, these four walls. You are so intentional one with another, and you were so intentional with me and my wife. We were discipled here um, when we came here about 11 years ago. Um, discipled here, and, and uh, I was trained here back when we had Intrust, Where's Greg Kurtz? Uh, back within trust. And um, our family, well, my wife and I, we were married here. We dedicated two of our boys here. We, we served here. And um, so we can just say what you guys do here inside these four walls is such a, a blessing. Um, but that's also an extension of what you do outside of these four walls. And we are just uh, delighted to get to be a part of that too in the work that, that God's doing uh, with us. Uh, and, and with his church in Tijuana, Mexico. We were sent out about three years ago, um, actually almost to this day, and, uh, and two, years of, two years ago, just about two years ago, we planted a, a small church there, a small Bible church called Iglesia Biblica Logos. And uh, it's just a small extension of, of, of Southside, but the true Southside, right? We're, we're on the true South side of the border. Um, <laughs> And God has been uh, just so faithful um, with that church. I want to share something with you all because I think it's just kind of indicative of of our vision. Well, the the vision of Southside and then our vision down there as well. The night before we planted uh, Logos, I received a text from Ken, from Ken Murphy. Um, And this is just a small excerpt of it, but I just want to read it because I think it it just puts on display kind of the the goal of all of this. Like, why why are we here, Right. Here's what he said to me. He said, go forward in quietness and trust as your strength. He said, I believe in the Holy Spirit and he loves to minister Christ through the word. Bring Christ into every meeting and conversation and sermon. And he says, you will certainly have the Spirit's help and ministry. It's that simple. I love that. And that has been the testimony uh, of 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 you all, of this church, of Southside, and I pray of, of Logos as well down in, in Tijuana, that Christ is being put on display every, every Sunday. That's our, that's our goal, ultimately, that Christ would be uh, exalted and made much of, for we behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so we are a church that is very simply Christ-centered. We love the gospel. We love his word, which governs us. That's our guide. And we love the Holy Spirit who supplies our everything uh, there. And so I'm just so humbled by what God is doing there. I have a few quick pictures to show you all, and then we'll get to the the sermon, I promise. So I think we're going to display them up here. We just have three pictures. I think you guys have already seen this picture. This is our congregation. Uh, We meet outside at a little school there in in a place called Playas de Tijuana. Um, Robert was so kind and came and put those sunshades over and Lord willing, this November, 
um, we are going to be uh, building a little bit of a structure on that school campus, uh, assuming they permit us to do so. Um, but that's the plan, because the rain's coming soon. So you can pray for us in that way. Uh, we need to get some shelter soon. You can go to the next picture. This is our, uh, just about a month ago, we had our baptism service. It was our first baptism. We baptized six people right there in the ocean. Uh, it was a real blessing. Um, really, really encouraged by that. Um, I think the, anyone that has desire to go abroad where there's an ocean, I think there should be training on how to baptize in the ocean because <laughs> we almost lost two people in the process. Uh, <laughs> you can go to the next picture. And that's our family there. Um, we were at a, a school event with my, my two older sons, Hudson and Titus, and uh, we were able to capture that. So praise God. Praise God. So humbled by you all, so humbled by this opportunity to preach God's word. Again, we're in John 7, and if you want to open with me, we'll be looking at verses 37 through 39, Um, just three very simple verses, but they are profound, and I pray that you would be encouraged by them as well. Let Let me pray before I read our text. Father, we are just so um, grateful, grateful for who you are, grateful that you are the God who reigns with all authority and all power. God, you reign. You uphold this world by the word of your power. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that Christ is reigning, that he's at your right hand, that you are seated on your throne. And thank you, God, that you are not hurried nor worried by the events that are at hand around us, Lord, all the the chaos around us. And yet, God, you continue to reign. And we thank you that we serve the risen King. And we thank you, God, that we also have the privilege as children to draw near, to draw near to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We thank you that we have access to your throne this morning, God, by your amazing grace, the grace that was poured out and shown to us at the cross when Christ died for us. We thank you, God, for that privilege. It is a privilege. And so, God, help us in this time. Because of that privilege, in light of that work, in light of what you have done, help us, God, to take seriously then this time together, that we would be focused and intent on your word, and that we would be dependent on your spirit to guide us and to lead us, and that your text would open up to us, Lord, and that your spirit would penetrate our hearts, and that we would be changed because of it, God, please. Conform us to the image of Christ. Transform us, God. Bring repentance where repentance is needed and bring transformation, God. I pray we are dependent on you, the God who reigns. We love you, Lord, and we praise your name in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me read our our text again. This is John 7. Verses 37 through 39. Now on the last day, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because it was not yet glorified. Lord, you know I need this text as much as every other person in this room. So now, God, would you do your work with your word on our hearts, Lord, as we read this does not return void. It will accomplish what you will for it to accomplish. So we, again, just yield ourselves to you and your spirit. Amen. It has been said before that what we believe about Jesus is the most important thing about us. It's the most important thing about us. And I'm convinced that, that a right understanding of Jesus begins with a right understanding of our sin, that universal problem that has wrought havoc in this world. 
distorting and tainting that beautiful reality that we have been created in the image of God to reflect his glory, and yet sin has come into this world and it's tainted that. It's destroyed that. Sin separates us from God, doesn't it? It separates us from God and it leaves us desperately searching for something to satisfy. We are like the Israelites of Jeremiah 2 when it says that they all and we all have forsaken him, the fountain of living waters, to hew for ourselves cisterns and broken cisterns that can hold no water. And so as we properly contend with this universal problem called sin, there will also arise a right understanding in us of our need for him. That's what this text is getting after. Those who are thirsty. The reason the gospel cannot and will not be changed, it has not changed in all history, is because the universal problem, our condition, has not changed. That is to say, we are all sinners who fall short of the glory of God. And we need a Savior. Every single one of us, we need a Savior whether you've been walking with him for three years or for 30 years, that need does not change, does it? In fact, oftentimes those who've walked with him even longer are those that are most aware of their need for him. And if you don't know him yet, and there are some who may not know him this morning, if you're still living under the bondage of sin and have never tasted of Christ or his goodness. My my prayer, I pray for you today that today may be your your day of visitation. Perhaps for the first time you may come to taste and see that the Lord is good. And for the first time by faith you will taste of him and you will know that soul-satisfying goodness that flows from Christ as he offers himself to us this morning in this text when he says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. That's for every person here this morning. One of my heroes of the faith, David Brainerd, was converted with this verse. This very verse, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And here's what he said when he first heard it. When he first heard it, he said it irritated him. He said that he felt like a man at the edge of a precipice, totally lost, unable to comprehend these words. But he said that God continued to bring those words to his heart. And the words that once irritated him suddenly captivated him him. He said, I longed and I longed and I longed. I thirsted and I thirsted and I thirsted. And then I drank. And he said, unspeakable glory seemed to open to the view of my soul. He said, once those words irritated me, then they captivated me. And then the third thing he said, he said, those words stimulated me. And for those who know his story, David Brainerd, though very, very sick, said that sometimes he couldn't even make it between towns. He had to ride on the horseback laying over the, laying over the top of the horse. Well, he devoted his life to bringing the gospel to the Indians in the United States. You know, he died when he was 29 years old. But it was these words, this free and glorious invitation from Christ here in John 7 that set Brainerd aflame for Christ. I pray he'd do the same here in this church, each and every one of us, in my heart, my soul as well. Well, our outline is very simple this morning. We have three verses here, and so we have two very simple points. Number one, we're going to see the invitation of Christ in verse 37. And number two, we're going to see the promise of Christ in verses 38 through 39. Okay? Invitation of Christ, promise of Christ. It's a little simpler than the Romans outlines I've been hearing. 
the first thing I want to draw your attention to is the, the context then of this chapter. I know many of you are already familiar with the book of John, but let's look specifically at this section too. Well, the, the, the gospel of John, we'll start there, is, is considered the spiritual gospel. It's written with a very different intent from the other gospel accounts, isn't it? The other gospel attends, uh, accounts focus more on the historical ministry and life of Christ, on the historical events around his ministry, whereas the gospel of John is more spiritual in its focus. It's got a different intent. John was written so that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and in believing, we might have, what, eternal life. The other thing that's interesting about John is the timeline is very interesting. It's very different. In fact, if you read through the Gospel of John, it's at this point in John 7 that Christ is already through two and a half years of his ministry. That is to say that we are in the last six months of Christ's ministry from John chapter 7 to the rest of the book. In fact, from John chapter 12 to the end of the book, we really deal with the last week of Christ's ministry. Well, why is that important? Well, because again, the emphasis here is different from the other gospel accounts. It's more spiritual in its intent and focus. And why is this timeline important for our text here this morning? Well, I think it helps us understand the urgency, the urgency with which Christ speaks here in John 7, the urgency of this invitation from Christ. He's in the last six months of his ministry. And the hostility against him has been growing, hasn't it? If you read through John, you already know that he's already, they've already tried to kill him. These religious leaders, they did back in John 5. They'll do it again multiple times in our context here into John 8 and all the way until his ultimate death by crucifixion. So Jesus is at this point in his ministry where again, there's a, there's a heightened urgency. He's speaking to those who want to kill him. And here he is in our context in John 7, here he is in Judea or in Jerusalem. He's at the epicenter of all of the hostility. He didn't shy away from it. He didn't run from it. No, he, he went right into it, right into the center of it. And he's at a feast, we're told in John 7 here. He's at a feast, and we know this feast is the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Tabernacles. It's one of three Jewish feasts, and it's the most popular of the three. It fell during the most significant month for the Jews, the seventh month. And it was in a time to commemorate God's provision and care for his people while they wandered in the wilderness. At this feast, it was, it was said that people built small huts and tabernacles. And then they dwelt in those tabernacles to commemorate that wilderness wandering. In fact, Josephus, the historian, said that some people would, would build those, those huts and they'd put them on rooftops and they were just scattered about throughout the, 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 the city and around the temple there to commemorate this time. There were tons of people there. It was the biggest of the feasts. There were lots of people that, that went to this feast. We, we can assume that Jesus went to every one of those feasts up to this point all through his childhood. It was also custom during the feast for water to be drawn in golden pitchers from a water source called the Pool of Siloam and carried to the temple where the priest poured the water out on the altar to signify salvation and blessings. And while they carried that water in these golden pitchers, they would recite from Psalms 113 to 118. And check this out, quick note. Some of the last words from Psalm 118 that would have been shared would have been, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. How about that? Keep those words in your mind because it's in that context. It's in that context that Jesus makes this glorious invitation. It was the last day of the feast, we're told. This was the final day of worship and reflection and the text says, Jesus stood. The emphasis on his standing indicates that he stood in a prominent place, right? To be seen by everyone. And then it says something profound. It says, he cried out. He cried out. These are emphatic words. Remember the urgency. Christ cried out. Literally, he yelled or shouted the same words that are used in John 11, when Jesus cried out, 
Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, come forth and hear the words that Jesus cries out. He says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. All of the rituals, all of the remembrance and reflection, all of the anticipation. And here Jesus stands and he cries out in the middle of this feast, in the last day of this feast, but in the middle of all the commotion. After all these rituals, he he stands and he cries out, offering himself. He's the fulfillment of the feast. It all points to him. Salvation and blessings, they're in Him, in Christ, the Messiah who's come and now stands before them. The context is really incredible because consider this, here are their makeshift huts and tabernacles scattered around Jerusalem and here is Christ, Emmanuel, God with us and He stands in their midst. John 1.14 He became flesh and dwelt among us. Literally, he set his tent. He tabernacled among us. And here's the fulfillment of that. This is the one. This is the one we've all been waiting for. And all of the ritual with with the, the water anticipating God's future blessings. And here Jesus comes and he says, here I am. Come and drink of me. Don't forget to whom he says this and when he says this. Just consider all of the rejection and hostility toward Jesus up to this point. They're trying to seize him. They're trying to kill him. They're murmuring all sorts of horrible things about him if you read in the text. And what does Jesus do? He offers himself. He offers himself to them. In spite of all of the hate, in spite of all of the enmity, Jesus offers himself. I just just been marveling as I was studying this, the humility and love behind these words. I pray we would all see that. Maybe you sit here today, an enemy of Christ, You've rejected him time and time again. And yet he still offers himself to you. Our patient and our humble God. Is he not? He says, come and drink of me. It's an invitation. It's an invitation. Even in the midst of all of our rejection, it's an invitation. I pray you'd see it that way. Now let us consider this offer. Jesus says there's an essential condition to his offering himself to us. He says, if anyone is thirsty, if anyone is thirsty, what does it mean to be thirsty? Certainly we can talk about it in a physical sense, right? That, that feeling you get in your throat, you know, when you've been working hard, and you feel thirsty. He's making a spiritual connection here. Let us start with what it is not. What does it not mean to be thirsty? This is not just mere curiosity, okay? Like some sort of adventure. I'm going to try something new. That's not what he's after. It's not just temporary relief from something, right? Jesus will make me happy or healthy, or he'll make my circumstances better. It's not just higher knowledge. It's not just something intellectual. This is why so many of the false religions are so successful, right? They offer some sort of temporary relief, and it's just, it's just really intellectualism. But there's nothing more than that. There's no grace. There's no, there's no gospel attached to that. There's no good news in that. It's just temporary relief. 
So this is also why we can't cheapen the gospel to simply be something of temporary relief. Well, you'll be happier if you accept Jesus. It's not that. It goes back to our original problem, which is sin. That's our problem. That's why the gospel hasn't changed. They may offer us temporary relief, some of those false religions, but here's the thing. They cannot They cannot regenerate. They cannot renew the heart. Only Jesus can. Only Jesus can. Only he can make a sinner clean. There's only one. And he says, come thirsty. Come thirsty. That means we come desperately thirsty. That's what this is after who is thirsty. We come intensely aware of our spiritual need, aware of our, our lack of purpose. Like maybe we're just going through the of life, like chaff in the wind, just being tossed to and fro from every end that may come about. We're just following the fads of this world that come and, and, and go. He says, come thirsty, aware of our need. Anyone who is thirsty. We come thirsty to find our rest. Rest from a restless conscience. Where we're just accused every day and we're, we're aware of the, the guilt. The fact that we are guilty, condemned by the law. And we long for peace and for rest. So to be thirsty implies conviction over sin. That there's conviction over sin. And that's, that's, that's a constant prayer of, of, of mine there in Mexico. That, that there'd be a conviction over sin. A true conviction. Anyone who is thirsty. Anyone who is thirsty. We come thirsty for righteousness. To be made clean. A clean heart. To be set free from the bondage of self-satisfaction. Of, of self-righteousness. To be free from the bondage of sin. In fact, just in a little bit, Jesus is going to cry out again. And he's going to say, the truth will make you free. Do you long to be free from the bondage of sin? Anyone who is thirsty. We come thirsty for hope, don't we? A longing to know what is to come. Because it all passes by so fast. We know the text in James 4.14. What is my life? It's like a vapor that appears for a little while and then, and then vanishes. And some of the older saints here can testify to that. It goes so fast. Anyone who is thirsty, thirsty for hope. Thirsty for a true hope, a glorious hope, the hope of glory. Anyone who is thirsty, he says, anyone who is thirsty, we come thirsty for God himself. We've been drinking of this world and all it offers us are broken cisterns that cannot satisfy. And this is a thirst for God. It's a thirst for God, the fountain of living water, to, to know him and to have relationship with him, with Yahweh Elohim, to have relationship with our relational God. Like the psalmist proclaims in Psalm 73, whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. It's a thirst for, for God, for the living God. So the obvious question, if you're with me this morning, if you're still awake, stay awake. If, if you're with me, the, the obvious question is, are you thirsty? Are you thirsty? Do you see your need for a savior? Do you see a need for redemption, the forgiveness of sins? Now we see why our understanding of the gospel is so tied to our understanding of, of sin. We must understand our condition to understand the remedy. Are you thirsty? The answer to that question is yes. And we'll deal with the other answer to that question, which may be no later. 
If the answer to that question is yes, the next question you must ask is how? How do I satisfy my thirst? Maybe this is your conscience pricking you right now and just saying, how do I satisfy my thirst? I'm thirsty. Well, Jesus tells us, come and drink of me. He tells us plainly, to come and drink is to believe. He says, he who believes in me. We don't argue about him, we approach him. We don't observe him simply, we drink. We believe in him. And what does that mean? Jesus says, come and drink of me. Believe in me. The me is Jesus. Again, all the prophecy and all the scriptures are pointing to him. He has, God sent his son, the word, Lagos, correctly, Lagos. He became flesh. And he says, believe in me. Believe in a crowd of religious people. He says, the true and living stands before you here at this feast. Come and drink of me. Our drinking of him means we believe in him and who he is. Our drinking of him is drinking of his forgiveness, the blood that was shed for us. It's not just an intellectual acceptance, although we know we must understand the gospel. It starts there, but that's not the point. This is to receive of him. It's to go and to receive like a, like a child, submitting to him and trusting in him. That's what, that's what Jesus is after. And not only that, our coming and our drinking is intensely personal. That is to say, you believe that this is, that this is true for you. You believe that he really can satisfy your thirst, that he speaks to you, that he offers himself to you, that he died for you, that he intercedes for you. The gospel is personal. And for all the kids here, that's why it's so important that it's not just the religion of my parents. No, no, this is intensely personal. Our faith is, is our union with Christ and what he's done. When he died, I died. When he rose, I rose spiritually, positionally with Christ. I remember when, just to capture this a little, I remember when our oldest son, Hudson, was two and he had a squirt gun that got left in the yard. And in mowing the grass, well, the squirt gun became a victim of the lawnmower blades, and it blew up into a thousand pieces. I'm getting some head nods. I think some of you have experienced that. Maybe not a squirt gun, but many, plenty of other things. Well, that same day, our son gathered all of those pieces together, and he brought them in his hands, and he came to Jackie, to his mom, and he said, Mommy, it's okay. Daddy can fix it. It is that disposition. It is that disposition. That kind of trust that is to characterize our coming to our God, our coming to Christ. God, you can take all of my sin, you can take all of my brokenness, and you alone, you alone can heal it, can make it right. That's what it means to go to him with a broken and contrite spirit. It's not to be ashamed of that, to bring it to him. And he delights in that. He delights in that saving, making all that brokenness, all those pieces become whole again because of what Christ has done. He came for the sick, not for the healthy. The only condition is thirst. It's not clean yourself up and then come. It's not go to church for one year and, and then come to me. It's not read your whole Bible and then maybe you can come. He says, come as you are. Come and drink. Drink of me. And we do this by faith. 
But let us not forget the object of our faith. Our faithful, merciful, just God is the one who says, come and drink. And he says, come and drink right now. Right now. That today may be the day of visitation for you. And notice then the promise, our second point. The promise when we drink. Look at verse 38. He says, he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Rivers of living water. The dry soul will be filled with a fountain of living water. And notice Jesus says, as the scripture said. So this is a divine promise. It's the divine promise of spiritual blessing. It's the compressing of all of those truths about himself, about the coming Messiah. As the scripture said, he is the fulfillment of all of that. He's the fulfillment of Isaiah 55, what we read this morning. He's the fulfillment of Psalm 118, the blessed one who comes in the name of the Lord. He's the fulfillment of it all. Look at it again at our text. Only he, only Christ can offer this. He says, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Notice he says rivers. That's the plural. It speaks to the abundance. These are deep, wide, ample rivers. Like the Colorado rivers in June, early June, when the snow melts off the mountains and they come raging down, right? We don't really have rivers in Tijuana. We have, we have sewage. It's about the extent of it. You, got, you have river, these massive rivers. And the, the picture here is incredible. This is an active supply. It's flowing. They never dry up. These are the rivers that God puts in us. From the innermost, the work of his spirit in us. From that needy soul, he will cause rivers to flow. Rivers. That's his gift to us. And we know he refers to the Holy Spirit. Why? Well, because he tells us so in verse 39. He says, but this he spoke of the Spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So here's the promise. He fills his people with his Spirit, with the Holy Spirit. And when we believe, this is instantaneous. We get all of him. We get all of the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit who raised Christ from the dead gives life to our spiritual corpses and teaches us to walk in obedience. We get all of him instantaneously, in a moment. It's incredible. But he says the Spirit was not yet give, given. The Spirit always is. He's behind all things, creation, anointing, right? The working in the hearts of Men, we can read about it all throughout the Old Testament. But here Jesus declares that this work of the Spirit in abundantly supplying life transcends all else he has done. He says, after the Son is glor glorified, which refers to Pentecost when he ascended, then we shall receive him. And we know this came to pass if you read in your Bibles in Acts chapter 2. And indeed, he resides in all believe, believers. He lives in us, transforming and conforming us to his image, making us look more and more like Jesus Christ. And, and we just say that the glorious work, oh, the glorious work of the Spirit. All we have to do is look back. Where was I before? And he's never to leave us. And I know many of you have heard this a hundred times, maybe some of you a thousand times, but I want to remind you of the great paradox of this truth. In one sense, when we drink of Christ, we are satisfied, and he promises us that we will never thirst again, right? He said that back in John 4 to the woman at the well. Why? Because he is the all-sufficient one, the living water. However, if you're a believer here, you know that the Christian life is marked by a constant thirst. 
because we thirst for more and more of Him. We desire more of Him. We desire more of that soul-satisfying presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, don't we? This is to say we have the Holy Spirit, but we are also commanded to be, be, to be filled by the Holy Spirit, to be being filled by the Holy Spirit, if we want to use the Greek. We desire more of Him, more of Christ. This is for the believers too. In Psalm 63, David cries out, O God, You are my God. I shall seek You earnestly. My soul thirsts for You. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Again, I ask, are you thirsty? It's not just a question for the unbeliever, but also for the believer this morning. We all know this world has a strange effect on us, doesn't it? It lulls us to sleep. And we can quickly start drinking from other things. And we can become dependent on those things. And suddenly we start living on those things. That's, that's the effect of idols, right? They're subtle and then they consume us. And there's so many of these empty cisterns in this life. They fake us out. We think they'll satisfy They don't, because they're like jars without a bottom to them. We go to drink of them and we get nothing, maybe a droplet for a second, but that's it. John Calvin rightly said, the human heart is a perpetual idol factory. Maybe it's a career. Our whole identity is wrapped up in the success of that career. Maybe it's family. When our kids are doing well, we're content. But when they struggle, our whole world collapses, falls apart. Maybe it's ministry. When the ministry is doing well, you feel really good. When someone didn't respond in the way that you hoped they would respond, well, that consumes you. I'll be vulnerable for just a moment. That, that, that's a real temptation when planting a church. And I wrestled hard with that, and in many ways still am wrestling with that. All of the reasons to rejoice, and then somehow you let the lows consume you. Bill didn't come to church today. That family left really quickly after the service. Sergio fell asleep again on me. And it just builds and it, and it festers, doesn't it? It builds and it festers and, it, and you, you kind of become a product of those idols, right? It happens in so many contexts. They determine your demeanor. For young men or young women, if you're, you're looking for that future person, you understand this too. It kind of consumes you. Your whole demeanor is determined by that. And it's wrong. We have to call it what it is. It's wrong. I'm I'm, I'm still learning this. I'm still learning this. But we cannot live on people or on outcomes. We need to live on the living water. We need to live on Christ, on the all-sufficient one, the only one who can satisfy our longing hearts. We need to live on Him, the fountain of living waters. What are you drinking from? That's another question for you this morning. What are you drinking from Where are you finding satisfaction? This is deeply about identity. It's also about practice. So here's a simple test. Where do we go when we are thirsty? Is it just entertainment? Endless YouTube videos? Facebook or Instagram feeds? There are so many places to get lost. Most of them are on our phones. It's been said that you have a mirror in your pocket. Your internet search history history reveals much about where you have been going and where you have been drinking from. It's one of the hard things when someone comes to you and they say, I know these things 
here. I know, I know these truths, but I just don't feel it. My affections aren't there. I'm, I'm convinced it's not always the case, but often the case. The reason is that we are not cultivating our hearts as we should. That is to say, we're not taking the time to pursue the Lord in His Word. We're not praying these things into our hearts. We're not taking that time to discipline ourselves as we're called to discipline ourselves into godliness. When our preoccupation does not match our profession, guess what? We invite sin to take a foothold. It, it, it seems so simple, but it's, it's quite complicated when we deal with the human heart. I think the call of this text then is simply to come again to Christ and receive from Him to be satisfied in Him who He is, His character, His attributes, His declarations, and to be satisfied in what He has done His work on the cross, the joy of our salvation, the peace that has been purchased for us, and the the rest that is guaranteed by His work for us in our place on the cross. Come and drink of me, Jesus said. The more I've had the joy of being in ministry, the more I realize that, that truly the unlocking of more of Him where we can say with the psalmist, the nearness of God, the nearness of the Lord is my joy. The key to that is repentance. It's repentance. I'm convinced that we don't repent enough. I'm not saying that we need to live in a constant state of regret. No, no, because that's that's to misunderstand repentance. Repentance is turning from sin. Sin. It's turning from spiritual dullness, lack of joy, apathy, laziness. It's turning from the things which which we have made more important than Christ. It's turning from those things. It's coming broken and aware of our thirst, of our need for Him. But get this, it's a turning to Christ it's a turning from those things and it's a turning to Christ. And you know this, but it's, it's turning to Him and remembering His incredible mercy and, and His incredible grace. It's turning to the fountain of living water, drinking of Him and being satisfied in Him. That's what this is. We drink of His forgiveness and grace so that those things no longer have an appeal to us because He is so much better than those things. And so in coming and drinking, I must ask you, have you experienced true repentance? True repentance, a turning from those things and and a receiving of Christ and all that He is and who He is. True thirst and then true satisfaction. True thirst, true sorrow, over our sins, and then true satisfaction, drinking up Christ and his forgiveness and what he's done for you. If not, Jesus invites you quite simply here in this text to come and drink of him. Come and drink. So we began saying the most important thing about us is what we believe about Jesus, right? We should get our view of Jesus from Jesus, and who does he declare himself to be? He declares himself to be the all-satisfying one. So simply go to him. Go to him and ask him to reveal himself to you. But go to him thirsty. Go to him thirsty. I I asked the question earlier, what if I'm not thirsty? What if you're seated, seated here today and you say, well, I hear you, I hear this invitation, but I'm just, I don't have that thirst in me. I'm just not thirsty. The only remedy, the only remedy that I have is the gospel. It's the only remedy we should have. We're called to be reminded of the gospel. I need to be reminded of it every day. When I'm in the bathroom disciplining my boys, I need to be reminded of the gospel again. We need to be reminded of the gospel And the gospel says that we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We have a massive problem. God is holy and we are not. We are by nature 
sinners who sin. We sin because we are sinners. We are not sinners because we sin. You see that? It's in our nature. It's in our very nature. We're sinners. In fact, the Bible says that we are dead in our sins. We're dead in them. That is to say that there's nothing that we can do in ourselves to clean ourselves up. We're like the squirt gun in a million pieces, right? No matter how much tape you try to use to to patch up that squirt gun, it's always going to leak water. And so we stand condemned. The wages of sin is death, declares the Bible. But we have a glorious but, the good news of the gospel, but God. There's one who's come, Christ Jesus, and he accomplished what we could never accomplish. He was the perfect one, the lamb without blemish and without spot. And he went up on a cross and he hung in our place. And at one point, if you recall, in John 19, he said, I am thirsty. He's the one who became thirsty so that we no longer would have to be thirsty by faith in him, in Christ. He died for us taking the punishment that we deserve. Each one of us, we deserve it. And he died for us. And he took it upon himself, that punishment. The wrath of God was poured out on him in our place. And then he rose, declaring victory over sin and death and guaranteeing, guaranteeing eternal life to those who would put their faith in him and guaranteeing the promise that we find in Revelation 22, the seal of the spirit, the promise of glory of one day, one day in heaven when it says that we will see the river of the water of life clear as crystal coming from the throne of God and of the lamb in the middle of the street. It's promised to us in the new Jerusalem. We have that to look forward to. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. That is promised to us. It's guaranteed to us. If you are a believer, you have the seal. You have the spirit. Praise God. That's where we're going. When we will drink fully and completely and never again thirst, never to be distracted by the idols of this world, by the idols that creep up in our hearts, never again we will drink fully of him. Praise God. Let me pray. Father, we just thank you. We thank you, God, for this glorious, glorious invitation that we have from Christ. And we thank you, God, for this glorious promise. It's really that simple. You say, come to me and drink by faith. Believe in me, Jesus declared. Believe in me, oh God. Would that be our disposition in our hearts this morning? Please, God, if there's anyone here that has not drunk of you, has not experienced that life-giving water, the water that flows freely from Christ, the living water, I pray, God, for them, that you would please, God, cause those wells to spring up in them, Lord, by your Holy Spirit. Do that miraculous and instantaneous work. Give them the Spirit, God. Give them faith by your grace, Lord. Change and transform every heart this morning. And for any that may have, maybe walk, may have been walking with you for, for many years, God, I just pray you'd renew that thirst in them, Lord, for more of you, for more of Christ, for more of who he is, for, 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 for greater discipline to seek after you, greater obedience to seek after you, to stop drinking of those things which we will know will never satisfy, those empty cisterns, but to drink fully of Christ, the fountain of living water. I pray, God, You do that work in our midst by your spirit, we ask in Jesus' name.